Hello and welcome to the webinar. Sorry about that. Had just a little uh, bit of a uh, crazy timing thing going on around here. But uh, I'm Kale Royer with TreeStuff.com. I am the uh, marketing lead and intergalactic liaison. Um, today we are doing a webinar on PHC for beginners, uh, including tree fertilization. Uh, I've got Trent Dix here on uh, my other screen. He is going to show up in a second, start talking about everything. Uh, we've got a great presentation for you here today. Um, and we'll do questions. Uh, we'll do questions kind of scattered throughout. I'll pop in and ask them uh, things. So go ahead and put that in the comments section. I'm watching the comments section on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, I'll be writing down the good ones. I will not be uh, mentioning the bad ones or you guys can answer the bad ones. I don't, whatever. Um, so a couple things uh, that we've got going on. One, uh, I just put two new FTC items. Uh, it's a French company, I think, uh, on the website. Go check those out. The Fury Ring and a new lowering device that's like ultra compact. Uh, we also have a sale going on right now. There is a uh, bag called the Tree Stuff Simple Rope Bag. If you don't have one, uh, then you're missing out. If you do have one, you probably have like two or three and you want more um, because they're so great. They're, they're really simple, really easy, really nice. Uh, if you spend $125 on Tree Stuff, you get a uh, free one of these bags. Um, and then if you spend another $125, so if you spend $500 on your order, you get two bags. Wait, I might have the, the number wrong on that, but you spend money and you get, you get more bags. So if you spend like $800, you end up with four bags or whatever it is. Here you go. Every $125 you spend. So $125 plus $125 is $250 for two free bags, just with the stuff that you would regularly buy. Use the code, no limit. Uh, we have some stuff coming up. Uh, check out our events page, treestuff.com slash events. Uh, we have webinars coming up, it's all on there. Uh, we've got the uh, lunch and learn stuff coming up on Mondays. So uh, during your lunch break, you just gather around and we'll have a live talk from, we've got Petzl, Cask, uh, we've got somebody from Davy Tree who's gonna be doing it in a little bit. Um, it's an hour long and they'll be taking questions, talking about technical stuff, talking about their products and what, what, what makes them different, what makes them great. So um, join us on those. Uh, Nick and I are gonna be going live some more, uh, just randomly uh, giving away things. So keep an eye out, keep your notifications on. And without further ado, I'm going to switch it over here to my buddy, uh, Trent. Take it away. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're here to talk a little bit about uh, beginner plant health care, and we're going to talk about uh, fertilizations. Uh, so pop in your questions. I'm looking forward. Glad to be back. And uh, let's get rolling. So <clears throat> to kind of give a little background about plant health care, you know, in years past now, we've had an explosion in the invasive pest, you know, coming over on cruise ships with the emerald ash borer, uh, the spotted lanternfly, we've got beech leaf disease, gypsy moth is out of control, hemlock woolly adelgia, they said it would never get up into the northeast and now it's in Maine. Uh, with different climates, we've had southern pine beetle outbreaks, there's oak wilt, there, there's so many different invasive pests, but this is something that we can base our plant health care on, you know, that can be one of the things that we jump out and go after. So we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about all the different steps and um, go ahead and move forward. So, you know, basic stuff when we get to a site, when we're doing plant health care, what plants are on site? What are some of the soil conditions? You know, we're going to talk about soil probes. You know, what are my service options on this site? You know, how many application choices do I have? Is it a spray? Is it a soil drench? Is it foliar sprays? You know, or, or do we want to do injections? So we're going to talk a little bit about all those tonight and kind of go through it and um, discuss it. So key internal market questions, you know, just the basics. Are there any tree killing or human irritating pest in my market? A comp
Oh, hold on. Let's get a change. Go ahead, Cal. No. Okay. Yeah. <sighs> you know, I, I guess that I guess that depends on uh, what you think. I mean, uh, gypsy moth can be nasty. The spotted lanternfly is, you know, uh, the all the little nymphs can be a pain. Uh, I, I guess it's really uh, what you consider gross, you know, in that aspect of it. Um, I guess the key thing too is, does it kill the tree or not? You know, what what are some of the things that do that? Cool. So uh, plant health care, you know, PHC, you know, it was an adapted term from IPM in the 1980s because uh, people thought we were too focused on the part, uh, a pest part of IPM. So this is a holistic approach by managing plant health care. You know, we're going to monitor the environment, the insect disease and populations, and that's how we're going to determine what we do, whether it's a biological, cultural or chemical mediation. All right. So that, that is plant health care's definition. You know, but why do we do this? What's so great about the trees? You know, we'll, we'll just talk about trees right now. You know, they reduce air pollution. They control storm water runoff. An ash tree will collect uh, almost 2,300 gallons of water in a year. Uh, they reduce erosion. They're going to help with the energy. Uh, in cities, we don't have the heat island effect because of them. Uh, we increase our property values. You know, a landscaped home is a lot more valuable. Uh, we have economic stability, crime rates decrease in certain areas where trees are, less noise and a better habitat for wildlife. So let's jump into it. Diagnostics for tree and shrubs. So this is going to be the basic stuff of what we do when we go out into the landscape. And then kind of at the end of this, I'll just do a simple review, you know, just to do the basics, guys, and talk about it. So background. You know, working as a physician instead of a mortician. So if you're a guy that's doing general tree care, you know, you're, you're the mortician. Now we're going to try to be a physician, a tree doctor in a sense. We're going to have lower equipment cost. We're going to have long-term relationships with our uh, clients. You know, like lawn care, it's a scheduled uh, maintenance program. We're not doing a 911 once and done. Um, we have to be able to knock that fear and uncertainty away from the people so we can capture that opportunity. Uh, a lot of people in the past would sub these programs out to different contractors. This is an opportunity for to grow your business. Or even if you're an older climber and you want something to kind of retire into that's a little bit easier, this could be your opportunity. Um, a lot of the new PHC advisors just lack field experience or how to be confident about diagnosis. We're going to talk about some of these things. You know, why do trees decline? You know, and how do we begin there? And we're going to talk a little bit about the climate change and how we've had new pests and different uh, reasons for trees declining. Um, blue spruce, you know, a prime example of climate change or, or not having enough cold, you know, we, we're losing them left and right. So this is just gonna be a basic diagnosis process and we're gonna go through it. What, uh, real quick, yeah. wh what, kind of, um, what kind of margins do you see doing plant health care uh, per well, application? Let, 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 let's do by day. You know, on an average, a technician could do between three to $5,000 a day. So you, you could be doing anywhere from 15 to 20,000 a week you know, in, in PHC. So it, it all depends on the price in that aspect of what you want to charge. But I mean, it's healthy margins, healthy margins. So what, so what, what are the main reasons to decline? And we're going to talk, talk about abiotic causes and uh, biotic causes, you know, but uh, some of it, 29% is abiotic. Nutrients, 5%. Nematodes, 10, 21 on the mites. Insects are 20, fungi. And then, then on the high side, it could be 41%. You guys can see the charts. But this is why they decline. And we're going to talk more about these different pests as we move forward. So before we begin, you know, there's insects. There's fungal and bacterial diseases. Uh, site conditions can play. Soil quality. We're going to talk about uh, planting errors, right? How many times are trees planted wrong? Um, but we don't want to overwhelm ourselves with it. So we're going to just do a, a 
a systematic approach to it, kind of narrow it down, why the plant's uh, dying. We're going to teach some simple uh, diagnostics, you know, and teach you how to look for signs and symptoms and try to narrow that down. You know, and, and our true goal is we just want to be environmentally sound and, and do the right treatment at the right time, the right tool in the toolbox. So where do we get information? All right, there's there's different cheat sheets out there. There's degree growing days, you know, uh, which, which we can look as a phenology. Uh, an instance of that, uh, when a black locust flowers, that's when the emerald ash borer adults will hatch. Uh, so you can create your own to show when pests hatch disease outbreaks. You can track degree growing days. I know a lot of people do that. There's websites that show you that. Uh, so we're, we're going to, to apply science and some common sense to these issues. You know, uh, a lot of times the homeowner or the client's going to call you when it's too late because the tree looks bad now. Uh, so all these things are, are questions that we have to keep in mind uh, when, when we're doing it and we're looking at it. Um, <clears throat> Pre-existing conditions, you know, trying to know the history too will help us to understand what's going on. Uh, we don't want to make a rapid diagnosis. So we'll, we'll talk more about that when we get into it. So defining the terms, all right, a sign, which is a visual evidence like an organism or some sort of disease, uh, rust is growing on the tree, some sort of larva or insect or eggs that we might see, spotted lanternfly eggs. The symptom would be the effect that the pest or disease is having on the plant, whether it's brown leaves, you know, a, a spot on the leaf, um, intermittent growth, you know, an abiotic factor is something that's physical it has nothing to do with a living organism. I, I know we've talked about that stuff in the past. Biotic or is anything that's affecting the plant, living organisms and stuff like that. Yeah. I have a really good question that I just got here. Uh, quick one, Susan Poisner uh, asking, I'm wondering where the stats are from showing what the main reasons are for tree death or decline. Uh, let me look and see if I have that in my notes. It was a slide I had. I will have to get that for. Her. I, I don't have that in my notes. It, it was a project that we worked on, uh, but I will find out and uh, okay. we can post it. All right, cool. Uh, we can continue. Okay, so disease, you know, that's a progressive disruption that functions, you know, that's going to cause the tree to either shut down. Uh, Dutch elm disease is a t type of disease that we could talk about. Uh, bacterial issues might be bacterial leaf scorch. Uh, weather conditions can play a role in this. Uh, fire blight exploding because of uh, certain wet conditions, cool temperatures at night. So all these things are, are, are what we're talking about. So those are some of the terms that we're going to need uh, to talk about. Insects or mites, you know, these are the small animals, the eight or six leggeds. Uh, there's different life stages of an insect, eggs, pupae, larva, nymph, adult, you know, uh, one can damage more than the other. Uh, emerald ash borer, the larva, that's what kills the tree. The adults feed on the leaves, but it's not very much. Uh, different insect predators may feed on some of these tree damaging pests, like aphids, ladybugs will feed on. So there may be certain preys or certain things that are out there. Uh, woodpeckers go after the larva in the emerald ash borer, but it's so random that there's no way that we can control it. But they'll come in and tear the bark off a tree if uh, there's a high woodpecker population. So those are some of the things that we look for for signs. Kinds of insects you'll see. Uh, piercing and sucking is one term for it. Leaf skeletonizers, che chewing insects. You know, the sucking insects that will cause the nutrients. There's some insects that will girdle the stem. Uh, boring insects that will feed on the xylem or full ohm, you know, that, that girdle the tree. So there's so many different aspects out there. Uh, cultural and planting sites, you know, what, what mimics? Uh, site conditions, you know, can resemble the impact or put a strain on it. Uh, does the tree appear diseased, uh, but there's no organism present? You know, what, what's going on? Is it a bad uh, soil? 
Is there something compacted? Uh, was there construction in that area? Uh, all these things can play into factors. Uh, we're going to get into talking about root damage, uh, pruning energy, and some of the things that we can do to correct that tonight. So th these are all the basic things of plant health care that we're looking for when we're in that landscape. So where do we begin with this? Th th this is where the excitement begins. Um, identifying the tree, all right? That is one of the most difficult things but there's great apps out there now that can help identify. Uh, but by knowing the tree species, we can narrow down what pest or disease could be attacking that tree. You know, uh, the simple one, emerald ash borer, it doesn't attack any other tree. Um, but what's the extent of the problem? Is it multiple trees? Is it a single tree? Do adjacent properties have it? So when you walk onto the landscape, you're looking at everywhere, the neighbors, you know, is there anything that can lead? Uh, was there a new pool installed? Does it look like they drove construction equipment over the area? Uh, was there lawn treatments done in the yard? Could it be a herbicide injury? You know, if we can take note of all of these things going on, we can start to narrow down the problems. Um, so, some of the other patterns, you know, what are the geometric patterns? Is there things showing on? Uh, can we see that uh, a pool drained? Was there a drain there? Uh, was snow removal done? And is there salt on that area? Uh, is there damage like a weed eater hit the tree? You know, look for all these different things. Uh, turf and shrubs can, and trees will all be affected differently. Uh, if you spill a growth regulator on grass, it'll typically kill it. Or did it run off? So knowing what happened or asking the homeowner, did you have any of these things done? Uh, they, they can lead to stuff, but you know, construction damage may take five years to show up. So if they built the house and it was five feet from these trees, it may take five years for the trees to die. You know, the, these are all things that we have to look at, you know, some of the uh, answers. But the speed of the decline is really something that we can look at by looking at the tree because a homeowner will never notice how far along the tree's been struggling. It could be for years. So looking at the different internodes, like how much the, the bud scales or bud scars are spread out, you know, we can determine these things. And measuring that growth, we can determine, oh, this tree's been struggling for the past four or five years. Th those are all things that we have to look for. And I think in the next slide coming up, we'll even show up more. Um, so we're starting at the top and then we're going down and we can tell that this tree has been struggling for probably the past seven years. We have not had any significant growth. Uh, you know, a typical growth might be three to three and a half inches if it's a really healthy tree, like a red sunset. So determining how healthy that is will, will give us an idea of what's actually going on. Uh, so summarizing, you know, the big picture is complete. That, that, that's what we wanted to know, how we go out and we look at this landscape. And now we're going to kind of dive into it a little bit more to look at specific problems, like was it planted wrong? Was it planted too deep? Was it buried in the mulch too much? So we have to look for all these different ideas to try to determine, you know, and every plant is different. It, it may be a plant was just planted in the wrong place. Maybe it needed a ton of water and they planted it in the desert, you know, all these things, simple stuff, but we have to be able to understand and hone on these problems. So some of the key abiotic issues, you know, grade change, girdling roots, was the tree planted uh, shallow and then a ton of mulch put on it and the tree's just girdling itself? Uh, has it had too much rain or too much drought? You know, all, all these can cause problems. Do you smell like a sulfur smell? You know, something that's killing the root. Uh, chemical injury, uh, winter, enter, winter injury can happen. You know, snow loads, uh, leaves were on the tree and it got full of that. And then we had uh, snapping, ice. You know, uh, all these are problems at risk. Pine needle decline, you know, what, what's going on? Does it have a like a disease, needle cast, diplodia? all these different options, you know, so what is going on? That, that, that's what we have to determine. 
Uh, some of the other things could be planning depth, right? Construction damage, uh, driving over trees, you know, causes huge damage. Improper pruning, guess what? We, we cut it off, it may not come back. Uh, some of the transplanting stress, you know, was it transplanted in the fall when it was supposed to be transplanted in the spring? Uh, did they water the tree before they did it? Lightning damage, hail, all, all those are issues that can come up. Some of the other micro issues that, that you may see, uh, mechanical injuries, uh, weed eaters are my favorite, uh, mulch volcanoes, right? Let, let, let's build a volcano around the tree and we can't see the, the root flare coming down. Uh, plant location, you know, it is, is it in the wrong area? Uh, did we plant a dogwood or redwood where, where it, it can't grow? It's an understory tree. Um, all these things come into play um, <clears throat> of different pictures, you know, it, it, the plant in the wrong place, right? Uh, that, that's a definition of the weed. That, that tree is too close to the house. It, it should have been planted more out in the landscape. All, all of those things, a chlorotic tree, you know, what's going on with the picture above, uh, doesn't have the proper nutrients in the soil to survive. All these things are basic ideas, but you can spot that when you walk into the landscape and make note of that. Um, animal damage, right? Deer rubbing on trees, uh, rabbits eating around the bark because they were hungry because of the snowpack, uh, standing water, you know, compacted soils. Uh, if we don't have airspace, you know, we're going to kill tree roots. If they dry out, we'll lose our feeder roots. Um, <clears throat> the picture there is a picture of a soil probe. You know, that, that's a great tool to have to be able to identify uh, what type of soil. Is it clay? Is it uh, a silt? Is it sand? You know, all those things will come into play. Uh, has, has the river came out of the water and flooded the area as the bottom picture? You know, all, all these things we have to keep in mind uh, to protect the tree. Uh, some of the other issues that are, really aren't problems that people will call you about. Slime mold, you know, something that's on the mulch, you know, or, or even around, it doesn't damage. Uh, lichens will grow. That just means you have uh, healthy, good air in that area. Uh, conifer uh, losing their needles in the fall. Well, it may just be losing old needles, you know, or, or excessive dry year, but you're going to see new needles. Uh, predatory insects, you know, what are they eating on? Uh, it could be ladybugs eating aphids. That's a good thing, you know, so that's a biological control. Um, looking at exfoliating bark, paper uh, bark maple, um, crepe myrtles for people that are in the south or even up here in the mid-Atlantic where I'm at. So these are all things that we can look at descriptions. Uh, we can Google and determine some of this stuff. And, and we'll talk about some apps coming up that are out there. But what can we do for some of these tree problems that you encounter? Uh, you know, preventing a grade change, you know, correcting that. Uh, digging a tree that's buried under a volcano mulch may help it. It may improve the way it looks. Uh, being able to remove the soil and look at the girdling roots, you know, and maybe we can cut them and do some uh, corrective pruning that way. Uh, putting up fences around trees so there, there's construction limits. Uh, limiting water if it's a compacted site. Uh, we're we're going to talk about air spading uh, in that sense. Uh, Irrigating trees if you need to. Typically, uh, you won't need to irrigate them after so often, but maybe it's a tree that needs a lot of water. Then maybe a drip irrigation system is a good thing. So th those are all things. Uh, pruning, you know, that's a great way to uh, repair damage, uh, corrective pruning, uh, but there can also be uh, excessive pruning, you know, that can damage trees. Uh, improper cuts can cause uh, trees to damage where it won't compartmentalize properly. Uh, topping, you know, uh, around the utility lines, that can cause damage if it's not done properly. Uh, it also will cause the tree to stress and then we'll get an attack towards it. So th these are all things that happen abiotic. So uh, other thing that's really common, right? Chemical injury. Th those are things uh, that was out there. We had the umbrellas thing where all it killed most of the evergreens out there. Fantastic for the turf, 
but it killed all uh, the evergreen trees around it. it. It was that good. It was that effective. Um, what else is there on this? <clears throat> uh, you can see this. What, was this a herbicide damage? Was this uh, a growth regulator uh, application that ran off? It, it could be multiple of things that happened in this area. <clears throat> so, so we have to determine what, what those things are. And, and we have to look at that <clears throat> and determine, was the spray tank contaminated? You know, uh, was there uh, a leak in a line? Was a uh, irrigation line leaky? You know, all those things can cause issues. So, so looking at the landscape and determining what happened, and we may not have an answer right away. So, and that's okay. No, you're all right. You're fine. So, transplant shock. That's another thing that happens a lot of time. Like you'll get a new uh, landscape plant came in. And, and, and the things that you don't know when it came from the nursery, was the uh, root ball dry? You know, is it having a hard time uh, getting water into that root ball? So trying to break that surface area. And there's different products, uh, Hydrotain, Nutri-Root. Nutri those will all help uh, encourage root development and allow that water penetration into that root ball. And it's also going to help the soil biology. So, so um Stake using approved stake methods. Don't do something that, that could wrong or could cause damage to the tree. You know, you're only wanting to put on a little bit of mulch, you know, two to three feet uh, deep, and you don't really want anything around the trunk flare. You want to go to zero on that. And, and what time did you plant? Did you plant in the middle of the summer? Did they plant at late fall or in the spring? You know, there, there there's times that are more proper to plant, and then there's times where you're going to have to water the tree a lot more to maintain it, you know, when, when we're in the summer and the heat and the drought. Uh, there's also micronutrient deficiencies, you know, a chlorotic tree, different areas, Colorado, uh, down in, in the Carolinas, there's tons of chlorotic trees. Uh, willow oaks struggle, they're, they're, uh, that sense. Uh, <clears throat> is there good soil biology? Is it an alkaline soil, you know? The only way we're ever going to correct a tree is by uh, improving the soil. And we're gonna talk about that in the fertilization, but these are all things. We, we could do injections into some of these trees and we're gonna talk about that too to enhance it, but it's just a temporary fix for a year or two. Uh, some of the different things, uh, mulching. You're all right, Kale, you're all right, you're fine. Um, but what's the positives? Like with mulching, there's uh, we're stopping weed. We're preventing mechanical damage because they don't have to mow by it. Uh, we're going to hold moisture into that. A lot of times, though, the mulch isn't removed. We, we pile it up to where we get 8, 10 inches of it. Uh, it's not supposed to be continually wet. That could cause a disease. Are, are we promoting girdling roots? You know, it, and is it piled up, the mulch, where we can't get any water into it because there's so much there? So proper methods is really key and being able to understand that and know what's right. Uh, <clears throat> but the, there's so many different possibilities of insect and disease uh, issues. It can be intimidating. So there's also cultural challenges. So we have to do the, the work and understand that. A and being able to know the tree species, we can narrow it down more. Uh, not all trees will be affected by certain insect diseases. So that makes it easier to determine you know, uh, that pests are, are, are specific to tree species, but we can join state extensions, you know, search engines, universities, they give out newsletters. Uh, Penn State gives out newsletters every uh, month, I believe. Uh, Maryland sends out a nice uh, weekly letter, you know, of what's going on and degree days and all that. So all these can be assets, you know, calling, uh, your, your local RTM with ArborJet can help you with different things and pests and stuff like that. Uh, you, you can go to get classes, different uh, signs, becoming an ISA certified arborist, you know, going to those classes can help. All these things can help educate you. Uh, the TCIA, all, all of these are opportunities. So diagnosis of diseases. There's two main groups. It's either fungi or bacteria. And we typically can only suppress many of the bacterial diseases out there. Uh, they could be cured. Uh, fungal diseases could be cured, prevented, or suppressed. 
but we have to um, assess them. You know, are they going to kill the tree or are they not? Um, leaf diseases like leaf spots are minor damage. You know, can it be tolerated? <clears throat> some diseases could kill leaves, some will defoliate them. Uh, some can weaken the tree. Uh, some could move from the flowers to leaves and twigs. And, and you know, some diseases can be fatal, like a blue stain, uh, you know, armillary root rot. A blue stain fungus from southern pine beetle can kill your pine trees. So all these things uh, we have to take in consideration and look at when we're doing this disease diagnosis. We may have to send it off to an extension agent to get a test to understand what it really is. We may not be able to identify it by just looking at it. Um, <clears throat> as I was saying before, there, there's insect vector pests, um, polyphagous shot hole borer, you know, uh, southern pine beetle, as I said before. So uh, some of these pests, ambrosia beetle, may bring a fungus in that can block the tree's vascular system. So it's not bad enough that they're causing the, the boring into the tree. They're introducing a, a disease that's going to travel throughout the tree and it's going to uh, cause it to die. So we could do a two-pronged approach. You know, we, we could do an insect control or a disease control. You know, it, it, it's just determining what we need. Maybe it's a spray, all, all, all these things. Uh, there's excellent, excellent books out there. One would be wood decay uh, fungi, you know, but uh, there, there's so many different books that we could talk about. Michael Durr's book on just plant identification is a wonderful tool to have as well. Um, so we narrow the, the diagnosis. We start determining whether it's an insect or disease. We examine the crown, uh, the crown of the tree. We look at the trunk flare. We look for bark wounds. Uh, do we see any uh, holes, uh, fungus growth? Uh, we look at the lower branches. Do we see any galls on the stems or the leaves? Uh, black sooty mold or honeydew may be a, a big idea. <clears throat> like spotted lanternfly, that's the big uh, thing. It's not really killing the trees, but it's causing uh, issue for homeowners because there's a black sooty mold or honeydew and it's a mess. Um, are leaves off color? Are they missing? Are they smaller than normal? Do we see different circles? Uh, what type of tree species? You know, we, we keep going back identifying that. Uh, what's the growth habit look like over the past few years? Is it consistent or are we getting shorter? Uh, some of the picture like in the bottom right, that, that is a southern pine beetle. And that's the tree pushing sap out, trying to protect itself. At some point, it won't have enough energy to do that. Uh, horned oak gall. You know, the, these are some of the things uh, you get in black city mold on a dogwood. Tar spot is another one. I mean, there's so many different things. So we're we're examining, we're looking at the landscape. Uh, we're going to have different tools, uh, you know, a jeweler's lens, you know, to look up close. Um, <clears throat> your phone, we're going to talk about that too, what a tool that can be. Uh, but we have to compare issues. You're good. You're good. Um, so signs and symptoms, you know, sometimes you can get lucky, and, but a lot of times you have to unravel this puzzle. Um, there's a deliberate approach. We don't want to do the incorrect diagnosis. We don't want to rush it. Uh, we want to be able to find an, an insect adult, you know, take pictures of it, bring it back if you need to look. There's bugwood.org. <clears throat> we just want to make sure we're, we're very accurate in what we do and, and write down and take good notes. Uh, so we can come back and make the best um, recommendation on the latest solutions out there. This is key. You know, I just want to put treatment without a proper diagnosis is malpractice. You know, we, we have to respect the science that's out there. Uh, we're, we're always going to read the label and follow that. We don't want to over treat. Uh, it's OK to say I don't know and I need to go back and look and, and talk to uh, some people to understand it. Uh, some trees can't be saved, and, and that's where tree removal comes in, all right? And, and preferably, you know, prevention is, is preferable to a cure. So maintaining this landscape and, and offering services of fertilization, you know, monitoring drought stress, uh, all these could be services that you offer. And, and going to the property once a month, you know, is a way of being plant healthcare, monitoring these things. So things to keep in mind, you know, uh, most uh, observations may not be a pest or disease. 
we're going to understand the history. We talked about that. There's always multiple things to look at. And we're looking at the big picture. We're looking at the neighbor's house. We're going to take our time and having no answer is okay, right? And, and there's other diagnosis. Uh, we have to prove it and be certain of it. So we may have to send things out to get tested. Uh, soil tests, they're affordable, but that's a great way to understand what's going on in the landscape and the turf. I mean, these are all things that we can do and it's an added service. It, it raises you above that competition. So now we're gonna get into some of the predisposing factors of stress, all right? Improper temperature, excess soil moisture, drought. Drought's a big thing and we're gonna talk about that. Improper nutrition, you know, is the soil have what it needs to survive? Improper light, is it a tree that's supposed to be planted in full sun and it's in full shade? Uh, humidity, uh, wet fo foliage, you know, guess what? The guy's hit it with the weed eater and it only has a quarter inch on the bark that it's tran uh, transpiring or make, doing photosynthesis, that's a problem. You don't know if you're gonna be able to save that. So what does stress do to the tree? Well, we're gonna see leaf drop possibly. We could see reduced growth, fall color coming on earlier, uh, putting out water sprouts, leaf drop, wilting, uh, leaf scorch, all these things could be something that we could see. But this is kind of review, guys, but th this is the key. This, this is the simplicity of it. We're going to properly ID the tree. Know what the normal for the tree is. You know, is it a walnut? Is it a tree of heaven? Is it a variegated Japanese maple? You know, what are these? What's normal for this tree? So knowing the tree allows us to determine what could be attacking it? We can Google it. It's that simple. What are the common problems from this? And now we can determine, is this aesthetic? Is this harmful? Or does our customer just want to treat for it because it's a nuisance to them? These are the things that we have to determine. But what, what are the signs? What's abnormal? What are the signs or symptoms? You know, <clears throat> so is there frask? Is there damage? You know, uh, is it a silent killer like the emerald ash borer that we don't see it? Is there wilting? It, could it be fire blight? You know, is there that curve that we see in the picture of the left? But, but there's other things that look similar. So we just have to be able to determine what, what is going on with that tree. These are tools that I, I think you should have if you're in plant health care. You, you should have the jeweler's thing. You should have a little knife, a shovel. A cell phone's a great tool. You can Google things. Pruning, binoculars to look up in the tree, and the soil probe. Those are all things that you should have to help diagnose what's going on in the landscape. So kind of in an overview, the big picture, plants experience less stress, they're gonna be more resistant to things. If you have drought stress on the turf and in the landscape, we're gonna see insect pressure. Clear wing borers attack trees that are under stress. So prevention of treatment might be drought management. We're gonna talk a little bit about that, how to minimize that drought stress and some of the things that we can do. So plant stress factors, all right? Biotic, competition, herbivore disease, insects. But abiotic are physical or chemical. So it could be temp, water, flood, radiation, UV, wind, magnetic field, air pollution, pesticide toxins, salt, right? Damage from snow removal, stuff like that. All these things, high, high salinity, did something happen? Did, did they dump the, the chlorine pool or the salt pool into the yard? And that's what's causing the issues. These are all things that we have to look at. Compacted soil, it's a construction site. They didn't do the proper thing. Look, look how they put the stakes into the ground by the tree. What can we be done? We're going to talk about it. Air knife or the air spade, mulching. They should have built a, a ring around the canopy, you know, a protection fence, construction protection fence around this tree. So we wouldn't have had what is happening there. They could have did a uh, growth regulation of shortstop to help put the energy back into the ground. These are all things that we're going to talk about. Mulch, you know, pros, 
low material costs, low labor costs. It's fast. It's easy to install. You know, we're adding that organic matter that we need. Uh, you know, customers do like to see grass. Uh, this is one of our ATMs. He, he made his yard into a, a beautiful landscape, you know, and that's fine. It takes time and maintenance, though. So some homeowners won't want to spend that time. Uh, benefits of it, we're going to feed the microbes. Uh, we're, we're adding that organic matter to the landscape. Uh, you can change soil that is uh, not well, you know, clay soil over time and, and mulch, you know, year over to year, you'll build an organic matter, especially if you like till it up or turn that soil in. So you're going to get more humic acids, better water holding capacity. You're going to have that organic layer, you know, two to three inches of organic matter that really helps plants grow. So I wanted to talk about this uh, exciting little acquisition for ArborJet now. Uh, we have the supersonic air knife. So this is a tool that you can use uh, for these compacted soils. You know, that's gonna put uh, air into the soil and allow you to loosen and unbury these roots and get into these utility lines without risk or damage. Uh, root excavation, tree relocations. You could use it for pipe and irrigation head repair. You know, this is a clean way to dig it up and you don't have to worry about uh, cutting that electric or gas line or fiber optics. You know, it makes it very easy to do. Um, this is our the LT standard. So this is, you know, just basic what we have out there, guys, a large pressure gauge. It's ergonomic trigger assembly. It's very lightweight. It's adjustable handle to heat control. It makes it very easy to come. It can come in a solid barrel or a split barrel, and there's different nozzles depending on what you want to do. So these are some of the tools that we have uh, for these root excavations, and we're going to look at some photos coming up. Uh, we also have the supersonic vacuum, which is a, you know, a great tool to be able to remove the soil that you've broken up. And then you can bring it back when you're done or bring in some different soils, a char or a compost, something that can amend to help uh, allow this tree to breathe. So these are some of the traditional practices that kill the trees, right? We installed the irrigation, we cut right through the roots. Uh, we had to put in a new sewer line or a new water line and we didn't do anything and we cut all the roots. These are some of the things that will kill trees over time. And, and I can show you in the next photo um, some of the proper ways to do it. You know, excavating the air out to where you can see where the roots are, to where you can uh, do these things. It's not cheap, though. You know, and people want to have to pay for this to do it. But you can do vertical mulching. You can do bare rooting. Uh, you can take care of trees. You can... Remove the roots to where you can make a clean cut to install the irrigation line if you need to go through it. These are things that you can do, but you can cut it and do it the right way. And that way you don't get disease transmission and you're not ripping it up and causing severe damage to the tree. Uh, some of the conditions that will favor disease development, uh, water, overwatering, uh, mowing, you know, so susceptible species. Was it a tree that was planted in the right place? Uh, difficult environments, you know, uh, all sun, really windy, it's drying the tree out. Um, no mulch around the tree. They're, they're mowing it and they've hit it with the mower or the weed eater all the time. Uh, high heat, humidity, uh, nutrient deficiency. It's a sandy soil. There's nothing in the soil for it to feed on. All these could be issues. But, yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, I've got a question. Uh, please, if you can hear sounds in the background, that's uh, that's just my child about to go for his bath. So, um, Michael Bean here is asking uh, for a little bit more info on what you do for soil sampling. Are you going to get into that uh, a little bit later? What you would do for soil sam like the soil test, or what you would do, uh, you, you you would use the soil probe. And then typically you would put it in a paper bag and mark, you know, what area that it is. And then you could go uh, to your extension agent or there's different uh, soil testing uh, offices around that you can find. Uh, I can, um, you know, depending on where you're at, I'm happy to point you in the right direction. 
but then they'll send it in and it may take a couple days and it depends on how advanced you want Michael I mean you can just do a basic one or you can really get into the micros and macros and they can give you all that information okay all right um, I mean he he's he was asked what you're looking for for each one I guess but uh, well it, it would depend on like uh, is it a clay soil is it is it sandy soil you know, uh, is it dry? Is there different layers? Like it, it looks like it goes through different things, different colors. Um, th that could be a whole nother thing on soil science, but there are different things that you can look for. Okay, great. All right. Um, you know, just making proper identifications of drought stress uh, is a, a salt or bicarbonate toxicity, nutrient deficiencies, you know, that, that we can determine. So that, that's what we want to look for, identifying it properly. Um, <clears throat> why does drought stress lead to pesticide use? Well, it, it depends on what is causing that problem. And, you know, drought stress is typically misidentified as a pest problem. So we'll treat for that when maybe we should have been treating water in the tree or, 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 or giving uh, a mixture of something to help reduce the amount of water that you would have to water. But initial watering could have helped it, you know, because that weakens it. And then when it's weakened, you'll get the secondary invaders like the clear wing borers or some of the different uh, diseases or pests that are out there. But, you know, we, we, since we talked about what is drought, you know, it's it's abnormal dry weather that that causes a, a serious lack of water, you know, an imbalance. Um, you know, in containers and trees in the landscape, every tree is different. Is the tree planted on the hill? Is the tree in a lower area? All trees are gonna respond differently to the drought. And how, how well were they rooted? You know, is it a girdle tree? All, all these things can play into effect. So it's an abiotic stressor that's releasing the water. Uh, and what will happen is the tree will run out of water, so it will shut down. It may drop leaves, you know, and, and it's going to cause an interference in this plant process. So typically it may, uh, if it's severe drought, it may defoliate. Uh, it could cause fall color initiation into that. It all depends on how severe and, and how old the trees are too. You know, a younger tree may just completely defoliate. And then you have uh, to hope that it has enough energy to relief really back out. Um, there's different perspectives of drought. You know, it's meteorological. Uh, typically, what we care about is the agricultural. You know, it's the amount of moisture in the soil before it meet, meets the need of the turf or ornamentals. Uh, you know, hydraulicals uh, below ground, you know, and then there's uh, shortages, which are socioeconomic, where the town may say you can't use the water because the reservoir are low. You know, some of the states out west are, are, are feeling that now. Uh, there's drought monitors from the USDA that you guys can go to online and get and get updates and, and see what's going on. This could be a way to sell PHC. You know, you could offer drought treatments, drought stress treatments. You know, uh, homeowners right now are vacationing perfect opportunity to have you watered your landscape. Are you sure it's safe? You know, before you go away. These, these are all opportunities for you guys to sell. So drought and water availability. All right, so that some of the impacts that we see with that, we could be increasing the amount of pesticide use. Do we have watering restrictions? Our, our water bills will get higher. Uh, we will have unhappy customers because things are dying. You could see removal and replacements and we might lose revenue. Because, uh, it, for instance, if you are a landscaper and you, you're not taking care of your uh, plants and you lose it and it's warranty work, well, you just lost money because you have to go back. So you're losing revenue and margin. Um, moisture stress will affect virtually all the processes, the physiological processes of the plant. So it will open the door for these opportunist uh, pests and diseases. So some of the effects, you know, uh, the first response in a, the plant, it closes the leaf stomata. So we're not getting as much water loss. This is a defense mechanism. But the problem is when that's closed, the carbon dioxide is not being absorbed. So we're not seeing the photosynthesis. So it's a reduction. 
And when we limit this, we don't see as much growth and we increase the, I can't even talk today, the susceptibility to the insect and diseases. Ugh. So enhanced issues, all right? In turf, you might see anthracnose, scrub damage. You know, these are all things, broadleaf weeds. Key things, you know, that drought stress will bring on is borer attacks. The, these will cause them to come in, clear wing borers because of tree stress, bark beetles, you know, cytospora canker. All of these are options because of drought stress. They're going to be enhanced. Uh, so what, what could be our strategy to stop drought? You know, what are some of the things that we can do? Well, we can plant the right plant in the right place. That's the easiest. Um, they've came out with improved turf in, in some of those. If it's a shady variety, you would plant a shade variety. Uh, thatch management, you know, aerating your turf. Uh, soil barriers, mulch, we've talked about it. There's different super and absorbent polymers. There's wetting agents, surfactants. Uh, we're going to talk about the hydroscopic humectants, and we're going to talk about some of the biostimulants and PGRs tonight. So th those are the strategies. Hydrotain. This is a hydroscopic humectant compound that will help you produce healthier plants. Uh, this will give you water savings uh, uh, all year long. You'll, you'll see a 50% reduction. It has some humectants in it, and it has a 10% non-ionic surfactant. It comes either in a granule or, or a liquid. If you're using the liquid, you need to make sure that you water it in and, and get enough water to put it in. The granular, you, you need to water in, but you don't have to do it right away. You know, you, you, you can spread that out. Uh, some of the benefits of this, you're gonna help with dry spots. Uh, this really enhances the nutrient efficiency. It will pull uh, your different products in, your fertilizers and stuff like that. It's an enhancement. Uh, if you're seeding or putting down sod, this is going to help uh, with improvement in germination. Uh, it's going to help uh, where you have irrigation restrictions, uh, localized dry spots. This is a product that's going to help you with that. Um, how does it work, right? So hydrotain attaches to that root zone. It, it, the molecules will attach to the root. It will help. Uh, protect those fine root hairs. Literally, if you have the hydrotain powder in your hands, it will collect the humidity in the air and turn to water droplets. So that's pulling the moisture from the soil through the air into that root zone. It's enhancing that. So you're going to see better results and, and not need as much water because it's pulling it in. Um, so just kind of the basic idea of soil moisture loss, right? We have runoff, gravity runs it down, we have groundwater recharging, the transpiration is taken up by the plant, and then we have the evaporation process where it's released into the air. Uh, so th that that's what typically happens when we get into that stress, we'll lose those fine root hairs, and that's where we get into problems, and, and we're not able to pull up that groundwater as well. So hydroscopic humectants. They're going to help eliminate or minimize your drought stress. They reduce your watering requirements. It's enhancing nutrient uptake. Uh, we can uh, improve your transplant establishment, germination, and, and your the your retail shelf life of the stuff. You know, it's going to help with all those things. So the, these are great tools, and we're going to talk about these in coming the upcoming slides even more. Uh, this is just a picture I wanted to show what hydrotain can do on a golf course, all right? It's a little turf, it, it, it's a little off bound, but I just wanna see, you know, before treatment, they were watering, look how green the roughs were and that. So you can see in the background where they reduced the watering, the roughs are now dry, they're brown. So just wanted to share that, go ahead, Gail, the next. So how do the pesticides work, all right? So we have contact sprays. That's where it must touch the pest directly or indirectly. It must be ingested or picked up from the leaf surface. A systemic is where it's a trunk injection, a granular, a soil, a bark spray. The, the, 
some foliars that are sprayed aren't true systemics, but they're more of a contact or a translaminar. You know, systemics are soluble enough they will move through the plant's vascular system. A translaminar will not have surface residue, but it will move into the leaf forms, into the shell reservoir, but they do, but they do not move through the vascular system. So, so those are the how they work. So contact versus systemic. This is what they do. Contact, limited pest. The pest must be present. We have higher use rates. They're non-targeted uh, insects can be killed as well. Uh, they can break down by the sun or the weather. You know, uh, we have to have coverage. It's essential. Uh, we cannot do larger trees. You know, we just don't have means to spray them. Uh, systemic, we can do diverse pests. Uh, we have different timing. Uh, we don't, we're not restricted by timing. Lower rates, uh, we're not harming as many beneficials. We have longer, longer residuals. You know, some products systemic can last up to two years and we don't have the photo de degradation. We have less limitations. So photos, spraying the landscape, bark sprays in the bottom, uh, soil drenches, you can use injectors. We're going to talk about that and we're going to get into injections and the different methods and all that coming up to go through this uh, beginner's look. Go ahead. So comparing the systemic applications, all right? So soil injections, great tool in the toolbox. There, there's different injection and drench equipment we're going to talk about. Uh, it's definitely less labor. This is a very fast uh, there are some limitations. Uh, if you can't get into the root zone around, you may not be able to use it. It does have the slowest translocation, so it's going to take time. You know, uh, it could take weeks, uh, could take a month, you know, depending on the organic matter to go in the tree. But there are always per acre limits on the soil uh, drenches to keep in mind when you're reading the label. Uh, injections, <clears throat> you have uh, different equipment that you can use. You're getting a full dose all the time. Uh, there's more labor than doing a drench, but it's ideal for any public places, your water areas, and it has faster uptake, and there are no acre limits. Go ahead. But there are also alternative control. You know, there's biological out there. There's natural predators. There's parasitoids. There's different pathogens. There's a fungus that will knock down gypsy moth if it's right. Uh, we, we can introduce them. We can monitor the activity. I know people that release ladybugs to eat the aphids. So you don't have to always go the route of, uh, of, of chemical. You know, there's cultural by removing it, uh, pruning it out, spraying water on it. Uh, there, there's different softer products. You know, there's hort oils, uh, dormant oils. You know, uh, you're not going to want to use high nitrogen fertilizers that promote fast growth, you know, you, you're, you're more after the slow release and we're gonna talk about that. Um, reasons to sell trunk injection solutions, all right? This is a targeted approach. This gives you the ability to improve your time management. You can do different treatments in the fall, you can do different treatments in the spring, you can treat in the rain wind, you know, where if you're spraying, you may not be able to go out in the wind. Uh, this will allow you to go into sensitive areas. Um, you have less environmental impact. You don't have customers or neighbors worrying about their pets, whether you're spraying into the yard. It's a lot more acceptable. Uh, typically, a lot of the cities are doing these treatments with EAB, uh, different things. So hundreds of thousands of trees have been treated. Injection is a tool in the toolbox. Your profitability, you wanted to know what that is? 60 to 70% margins. That's a really good margin. That's right. Just, that's just, what we want. Just so you know, that's that's real nice. So, how do they work? You know, how does injection work? Well, we're injecting a systemic pesticide into the base of the tree, and we're going to talk about this. But then we're using the photosynthesis process or the transpiration process through the tree to pull that chemical up into it. And we're going to talk about some of the different chemicals uh, that we have that are out there. And, you know, there's different protect and contact uh, pesticides as well that you would spray on or bark spray on. So why do we do this? Well, it's nice because 
the materials injected in the tree, it stays inside. We're doing minimal impact to the environment. Uh, we don't have any exposure to the public and minimal to the applicator. Uh, public locations, this is ideal, right? We're getting longer residuals. We don't have the breakdowns of the degradations. We're treating for only the pests that are feeding on the tree. And, and we do have a wider treatment window. You have a lot more opportunity. And if you're busy in the spring doing fertilizations or some of your sprays, you have a bigger opportunity to spread out your time. You know, typically we would say an injection season is from leaf out to leaf drop. But some of these things that we're learning about Diplodia and stuff like that, we're, we're adding those treatment windows into the wintertime even because the pine trees aren't active, the sap isn't moving, it's easier to do these treatments. So all these things come into play. Uh, so some of the advantage, you know, uh, we, we have most uh, tree and insect disease issues covered. We're doing a very low dose. Uh, we talked about, go ahead and keep going, Kale. Uh, you know, this just gives you uh, things. We can do micronutrients. You know, I'm going to show you some pictures coming up of how we can fix chlorotic trees. Uh, you know, this is nice because you, you don't have the exposure. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about the quick jet air, but the nice thing with that device is you can inject right out of the bottle. Go ahead. Uh, so let's talk about how, how, how do we determine, you know, what are some of the means when we go out? Typically, you've got to measure the diameter at breast height. So you want to have a diameter tape. You want to be able to go out and do your calculations. Most labels will go based on that. So we don't want to guess because we could overdose or underdose, or we might spend too little time or not bring enough product. Uh, you know, trees are measured at four and a half feet, and that's where we determine, and the injections will occur lower, and we'll talk about that. Trees that have multiple trunks that are split below four and a half feet, then we would measure each tree as an individual tree and add that together to do an injection in a single tree. So if it's multiple trunks below four and a half feet, we would measure each trunk as a tree and then add that together to do that injection. Uh, then it's very simple. You know, you drill, plug, and inject. And, and we'll talk a little bit about plugless injections, but we'll talk about why the plugs are valuable as well. So steps in slow motion, all right? So we're measuring this tree. We're going to determine our injection sites, all right? And when we're determining the injection sites, we can go from anywhere from zero to 18 inches, but the ideal height where we wanna do those is that zero to six inch range. Six inches is where that trunk flare is actively growing, you know, and we wanna go into that. We're, we we wanna stay away from uh, compressed sites where uh, there could be damage or the tree doesn't look like it's growing if it's flat. And then we're gonna use um, the special drill bits provided and then we're gonna place the plug and then we're gonna tap it to the correct death and we're gonna get into that. And knowing the diameter, so how do I know how many plugs? Well, if you're using the quick jet air or the quick jet, you would be DBH divided by two. And if you're using a, an IV system or the F series, you would do DBH divided by three. The label's gonna dictate though, whatever it states is what you're going to do. So you're gonna read the label, but typically, it's DBH divided by two by the quick jet, quick jet air, and the DBH divided by three for the IV and F series. So looking at the flares, that's where we're determined. Th those are where we want to go. We can go from anywhere to 18 inches, but if it's flat, it's a no-go. We want to avoid the valleys, flat spots, girdling roots, decay. If we drill in and we see brown, we're, we're, we should just put a plug back in because we're not going to inject because it's not live tissue. We're looking for that white xylem, that's live tissue. Uh, we wanna go typically an inch to inch and a half into the xylem tissue. You might go two inches on an evergreen because you want that reservoir. We're trying to space every six inches apart. We don't wanna use dr dull drill bits. We wanna use nice sharp uh, because they will increase our productivity. Uh, our drill bits are actually patented to where they pull the wood boring shavings out to where you get a faster uptake. So we have different sizes. We have a 3 8 brad point or we have a 9 30 seconds. The number four plug is the larger. It's going to be your fastest injection. Uh, the number three 
you might use that on trees eight inch, six inch or smaller, an older tree that you're worried that may not compartmentalize. And then there is the stinger needle if you want to do plugless. You're in the you're in the forest doing applications, then plugless may be the route. That's a 736 Brad point bit. What is the arbor plug? All right, uh, there's a lot of debate about this. I'll, I'll tell you what I think the strengths are, and, and there's always plugless. We've had that since the beginning. But number one, the plug is plastic. It has a rubber septum in it that keeps the material in the tree. It has three barbs on it that will grip into the wood. Number one, it keeps the product in the tree. That's the value of the arbor plug. Number two, it keeps any pests or diseases from entering that tree. And then number three, which I think is key, is it allows that tree to compartmentalize faster than anything. You know, typically 10 months in the Northeast is what we're seeing. It could be faster in the Southern states, but in the Northeast on an oak tree, we saw 10 months compartmentalization. So setting this plug is key. You know, we wanna make sure that that top plug, or we can see a white ring around that, of that xylem tissue. And that way we know that that plug is set properly and we will get the fastest commercialization because that plug set that way. <clears throat> so this is a perfect picture. See that white xylem, that's a perfect plug set. And look how thick that cambium is. So we hammer that plug in, we see that white halo. That is the perfect plug set. That will ensure that we don't have any leakage and the tree will compartmentalize very fast. You know, when you come back, you should see a belly button and that gone. Go ahead, go to the next slide. So properly setting, shallow set, top, you know, you could have damage. Plug pushing out, that was because it was set shallow. A deep set, you're just losing productivity. No plug, it doesn't close. It takes years for a plugless thing to close. It's not gonna be fast. Plug set just right, no plug, no close. <clears throat> close over, you know, nine months in the photo there. So that's the key. You can see on the picture on the right, the correct, the shallow. What happens with the shallow? If, if you're using high pressure, you could cause some damage. You know, you could cause the uh, cambium to separate. That's what we don't want. We wanna set the prog, plug properly and correct. A deep plug, it's okay. You're just going to have slower uptake. So this is site closure, what it looks like with new wood. So the tree will continue to grow over that plug. You will get new growth. Five years down the road, you might be injecting into that same site. There is no decay. Michigan State did uh, a testing on it. There is no decay. That, that wood compartmentalized, it's still alive, but it's just not active. And you can kind of see with those photos what it looks like. Uh, that picture there with the new wood, that plug may have been a little uh, shallow. That's why you see that brown, like it didn't close over it right. Uh, when injection methods go wrong, all right? So a plugless injection site, typically you could lose one to two mils. And, and if it's not a good uptake day, you may not have very good injection because you can't uh, increase pressure to where it would take. Uh, the plug wasn't set properly, you know, uh, or it was the wrong size. Th these are all things that could happen shortly after injection. These are some of the things that you could see. Uh, more, more pictures leaking out. What, what happens, you know, it was a bad uptake day. It didn't go in. Th these are some of the things that can happen. When, when you have a plugless injection. I'm not saying that it's not right. You could be in the woods and, and no one's around, but I think in an urban environment, I would be using plugs. I think it's the safe way to go. Uh, you know, plugless injections can also be wrong. You, you know, if, if you're not drilling a hole or anything like that and you're pushing it, you can cause damage. You, you need that plug to get into the xylem. You're not going to absorb anything in by, by inserting a needle. You have to get into that live tissue for the tree to uh, use transpiration to pull it up. So those are some of the uh, damage or wounds that you get from that. 
a uh, little bit about equipment. All right. So everybody, what do I need when I'm starting out? I, I truthfully, I like the F series. You know, if you're by yourself, this gives you the opportunities of a fast, uh, high pressure system. You could go up to 120 PSI. Do I think you need that? No. I think you might get to 80 or 90 on certain trees or if it's a slow day. Uh, this is very flexible. It gives you a 300 uh, or 650 milliliter bottle or a one and a half liter bottle. So you can do fungicides or insecticide applications. Uh, you have a, a plug to where you could go up to 12 uh, needles. So you can do some larger things. And it actually has a cap that you can remove so you're not taking the top off the bottle. That was one of the improvements we made from the tree IVs. Go ahead. Uh, quick jet air. So this is probably the the best device uh, for production, especially if you're doing insecticide treatments. It's air powered. You can fill at a local dive shop or possibly a paintball place. Uh, it's more productive. There's less labor. Uh, we're going to talk about triage R10, and I really think that this device is a game changer. Uh, you don't have to calibrate it. It has a five mil dose. It's just an on and off, and it's a one switch, you know, and this is by far the most efficient tool when you're doing like EAB treatments or even BLS treatments like that. This is the tool and the way to go. Um, AccuFlow, I'm excited about this. Th this is our new soil injector, all right? This is versatile, portable. It's battery operated. It's not going to be outmatched. It's lightweight. It's quiet. It has high pressure. It has repeatable dosing. It goes from zero to 300 mils. It has a battery that will last for 16 tankfuls. It actually has recirculation. So if you're doing short stop applications, every time you fill your plunger, you're recirculating in the tank. Uh, and it's very easy to use. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, so repeatable dosing, Th this has a, a stainless steel lock neck collar that allows you to go in 10 to 300 mils. And we have built uh, charts for this for short stop, um, Nutri-Root, our Arbor RX for the smaller trees that you can use with this device. Um, so you have a actuation toggle that goes left to right to fill and inject. Uh, very easy to use. Uh, it's 11 pounds, so it's very lightweight. It's very easy to use. This is perfect tool to just start out in plant healthcare. You know, it, it, very easy handling. There's a handle underneath where that handle is that you can lift it and carry it with. And that, and we've got a patent pending for this. Uh, flexible, it's very low carbon. It's an 18 volt ba battery. It, it comes from the flow zone backpack. This is the latest model. It has five different pre, uh, pressure adjustments. And the best part is guys, you can take the soil injector off and use it as a, a bark spray or a foliar application. I was spraying almost 20 feet with it. Uh, so you can use it for PGRs, fertilizers, pesticides and more. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, so it has the automatic recirculation. So we have two lines, so it's, uh, you're agitating while in use, and, and you can go up to 100 PSI in the soil, guys. It, it's such a great tool. Uh, very easy to use. Uh, so it outmatches the competition that we have. It, it has uh, great dosing recommendations from 10 to 300 mils. Uh, we have adjustable pr pressure, so if you don't need a lot, you could go light. It's very lightweight, and, and you know it's great for all these products. And the other thing, you know, it has multiple uses. You know, you can spray inject, so you could use it with uh, watering fertilizers, you know, de-icers, cleaners, sealants, insecticides, fungicides. It comes with two uh, power washing heads if you want to clean trucks. So, I mean, you have so many op options. So three hours, 76 gallons per charge. All right, let's get into chemistry. All right, so there's different chemistries out there, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our product line. Uh, Triage R10 is, is a 9.7% emectin benzoate. Uh, it's a restricted use product, but it treats three times faster with 
less than half the dose needed. And we've seen it be three times faster in hardwoods and seven times faster in, in the conifers. Go ahead. Uh, Imaget is our imidacloprid product. Uh, we also have Imaget 10, uh, which would be our 10%, but this is the highest performing injectable imidacloprid. Uh, this will give you three years of control for like Hemoquilla adelgia. This is really good for Japanese uh, beetles, uh, millibugs, a white fly. Uh, it's very fast acting. Typically after injection, it's, it's uh, throughout the tree within three to five days. Uh, Ace Jet. So this is Asaphate. This would be your 911 product. This is what you would do when you need a fast acting uh, this is what they're using up in Gypsy Moth when you need something to knock it down. Uh, the problem with this, you only have typically a residual of about 60 days. It could be less if there's a lot of rainfall. Uh, I forgot to mention on the Imaget, you'll get about a uh, growing season on that. Uh, but Ace Jet's great. Hard scales, uh, bagworms, anything like that. This is fast acting. And, and you know, we've seen it act with act within an hour, have stuff like it's snowing on white flies and stuff like that. So it's very fast going through the tree because it's a powder uh, mixed with water. Uh, common piercing, common piercing and sucking pests. This would be something that you could use with Imaget. Ace jet may work, but aphids, lace bugs, scales, white fly, millibugs. You know, these are some of the simple pests I'm trying to give you. Uh, some of the products that will target that. Go ahead. Uh, Pearson sucking. So th this is, is a pest that's uh, going into the epidural layer of the plant and they're sucking the sails. You know, you might get step in, stippling effect on the foliage. Uh, this is where your honeydew comes from. And th then you'll get the black sooty mold growing from this. These are some of the pests to give you the background, simple stuff. Propozole. So this is our propiconazole. Uh, th this is uh, technical material from Zincenta. It could be used as a trunk injection or a foliar spray. Uh, this is the broadest label on the market. So this is something that you would use for oak wilt. Uh, Dutch elm disease, you'll get at least two years control with that. Uh, powdery mildew, red thread. So there's lots of options for this product. Anthracnose. This is caused by several different fungi, but you can see it by liaisons on the tree. Warm, wet, humid weather with poor air circulations. Typically, your old sycamores will be uh, one of the uh, worst trees to get it. Um, winter pruning, you know, controls could be chlorothyl, copper sprays, propiconazole. I like to inject early in the fall. That, that's the ideal time to do uh, propiconazole. I've had great results with it. Um, I'm not gonna tell you that uh, if you had severe anthracnose that you might not defoliate, but the recovery is so much better. You won't have weeks at a time where the tree is defoliated. Typically it may defoliate and then recover the next day, next day or two, and then you'll have leaves the rest of the year. Uh, you know, apple scab, elm anthracnose, horse chestnut, splite. This is all uh, things that you can see. <clears throat> with propyl phosphojet. I like this product. Th this is a phosphoric acid. It's a systemic fungicide, but it's actually a plant health response elicitor. So what that does, or what that means, is it turns on the plant's natural defense system. So it's going to help suppress plant diseases in the spring or uh, fall. This is something that I would use for Fire blight, if it's after flowering and the tree has leaves, it, it will help suppress it. It strengthens the plant cell walls. Uh, you can do a trunk injection, you can do a bark spray, you could do full layer applications. This is a fantastic product. Uh, you could do a fall injection for apple scab and get 85% leaf hold uh, by doing it in the fall. Fire blight, you know, this is a bacterium that overwinters. Uh, the spring bacteria oozes, uh, bacteria sprains by ra rain, wind, birds, uh, young shoots will wilt and die, cankers develop, you have to be sanitary, uh, streptomycin, coffer sulfates, uh, oxytetracycline or arbor, arbor OTC, and it will go dormant when it gets above 85 degrees. 
Arbor OTC. So this is our oxytetracycline. It's a systemic. This is going to be something that suppresses your bacterial leaf diseases. It's not going to cure them. It's going to suppress them. You can't use it on food bearing trees and you're going to get typically one year of suppression. Uh, bacterial leaf scorch. So this is something that's becoming more and more common, at least around here. You'll get marginal necrosis. You'll get uh, scorch symptoms. Typically, this happens in June. Uh, you could treat with the Arbor OTC. You could also treat with shortstop of Pactrobutrazole, which will also help it. You know, you're slowing down the tree. Go ahead to the next. Um, just some more photos of that. Um, so this photo I like to share. This is one of my customer in Pennsylvania, but I, I think it's worth talking about. You know, um, when treating with bacterial leaf squirts, you should always treat for the vector. You know, try to kill the skips uh, that are moving the disease. So Imaget would do that. So you want to kill the vector. Uh, treating with Arbor OTC will suppress it. But this customer of mine actually treated with OTC and Phosphojet, one after the other. And the nice thing was, is instead of having to inject every year, he was able to go every other year. So he would come in in the off year and do like a vertical mulch treatment to be on the property. But uh, this was four years into it, and he's treated this tree now probably 14 or 15 years. And the neighbor tree, the neighbor's tree died within four years. That's actually the property line, and they didn't want to treat. So um, as a sole, this is a, a unique product. Uh, it's underutilized, but it's OMRI listed. It's a 6% Asduractin uh, powdered neem. So it's non-oil based. So it's not gonna be like your neem oil, uh, but <clears throat> one more, one more. Uh, but it's an insect growth regulator. It's an IGR. So the nice thing with this is you could spray it, you could drench it, you could uh, chemigate it, trunk injection, um, greenhouse, nursery, but it's a systemic. So you're gonna get about 14 to 21 days as a spray and probably about a month with an injection. So a lot of people would use this for EAB, but the key is to time it right to when the larvae are feeding to make sure you get it. But the nice thing is, is it's not gonna be a quick kill. It's going to stop the feeding and, and um, you could use it on fruit trees at same day harvest. So you could uh, spray or, or inject and then harvest in the uh, afternoon. So that's very nice. Go ahead. Eco 140, so this is our 40% organic certified botanical oil. It's a 25B product, so it's safe for around people. Uh, this is a fantastic product because it's an insecticide, a miticide, and a fungicide. So this is something that you can work into your basic IPM programs, you know, to do it. You can add in um, Azosol too, so do a one-two punch. It gives you that. I, I had a customer that used this on uh, evergreens instead of like a hort oil or a dormant oil because he was right by uh, a family's house and he didn't want to deal with it. And this smells like a, a pe minty peppermint smell. It's, it, it's pleasant and, and it worked fantastic. Go ahead to the next. Uh, so Arborjet trunk injection. Uh, Many different tools of insect control. We've talked about it, but you can see all the different better areas controls. You can go on to the next. Uh, short stop. So this is a growth regulator. It's 22%. It's for tree and shrubs now. This is going to reduce your pruning and your fine root hair growth. It's going to reduce drought stress, uh, increase chlorophyll. And we can get into the next slide and we'll go through the process. So this is a program. It's just not a product. Th this last as a soil injection or a basal drench for three years, depending on where you're at. If you get closer to the Florida markets or the Southern areas, Texas, it may only be two years because the growing season's longer. Um, you know, it's gonna give th thicker leaf cuticles, uh, better chlorophyll, favorable hormonal changes. You know, it's a lot tighter growth. Um, I wasn't a believer until I tried it on my uh, red maples at my house. And this is my fourth year and, and I was absolutely amazed. I went from three and a half inches of growth to about three quarters of an inch of a growth. And it's such a tighter, compact leaves. Uh, my neighbor's leaves started to uh, release in probably September 
last year because of drought and I held my leaves till November. So it gives better storage. It, it makes uh, things. The interesting thing to me this year was uh, most of my neighbor's trees leafed out uh, two weeks before and were fully leafed out. And I held my seed and really leafed out two to three weeks later. It was uh, really strange. And I don't know why that was, but it was interesting. Go ahead to the next. So, sorry, Kale, this is all things I missed. <laughs> Back one more. <clears throat> so, um, it's a group. Yeah, just fly through the, there you go, perfect, good. Uh, so this is gonna reduce pruning. It's gonna improve your appearance, your color, your density. It's gonna reduce labor costs. So this is something that you could come in as basic plant healthcare. You could offer it to a landscaper, you know, this is a way I can reduce labor or, or, or reduce difficult site issues. Uh, this is gonna give you drought protection, improve some of the chlorotic conditions, disease resistance, you can go to the next. Uh, improve appearance, you know, you're gonna get better plant density, uh, better shrub color. And, and the nice thing with the shrubs is you can actually, if you wanted to go shorter, if you don't want the, the two to three years, you might go with uh, six to eight weeks with a full foliar spray. You know, so you're gonna keep the plants within the boundaries. Go ahead to the next. Uh, improve appearance, you can see how much thicker it is, uh, better shrub color, reduce elongation. Uh, this is some of the pictures from uh, uh, done at Michigan State. You can see uh, before and afters. Uh, the growth of it, how much tighter it was. I don't know why anyone wants to prune barberries. They're not very friendly. Um, but this gives you an increased service. It's another program you can offer. There, there's always a tree or something going on in the landscape that you could use this on. Go ahead. Uh, labor, you know, look at this. This is kind of neat. This is a study that was done on American Holly in South Carolina. A couple more hits, I think, Kale. Um, so 2018, they did four, four full shearings at 32 man hours. In 2019, they did an application and it was only three light tips and it was only six man hours. Look at the time savings. That frees up man hours to where you can go do something else and make money. So that, that's a nice thing. You can go to the next. So you can support plant health in some of the difficult areas, you know, uh, where, where they're not easy to manage. You can reduce the excessive growth in these areas so you don't have to prune as much. Uh, and improve, improve your root support, <coughs> excuse me, and help with drought stress in some of the low moisture areas. This is something you can help with the heat island effect. Like you can see in the picture, you, you can work on these parking lot islands. Okay, drought stress, this is a great tool. You know, this, this is something that will last for three years you know, on, on trees and it will even help on shrubs. It's gonna reduce your water loss. You know, it makes the guard cells tighter and, and you're not gonna lose as much. It increases your fine root hair development, which will uh, in turn aid in uh, your drought stress, you know, absorbing more of all that. Um, reduce soil availability, you know, where, where the, it's a parking lot, you know, there's nothing going on. Water's not ac adequate, you're getting heat off the cars. This is a way to uh, treat it. You can see the parking lot difference. Treated with summer 2018, and that's what it looks like in 2019. It changes the look of the tree. It, it really does. It makes it tighter, smaller leaves. And it, it, it really works well. So these are, are the rate charts. We can kind of flow through these. But what we did is we took, based on the tree type, and going across the top is the DBH, and it tells you the specified amount of product. And at the bottom, there is a batch rate because it's one part product to 11 parts water. So you can determine how much you need to make up. And we actually have rate charts for the uh, AccuFlow soil injector as well. Go ahead and you can keep moving. So this is for the shrubs. Uh, this is the drench chart here. It, it's based on the cubic volume of the tree <clears throat> to determine that. And then on the next one, it is the foliar spray. And, and the way this works, it, it's not, the one to 11 parts, it's actually based on the amount of chemical, which if you go to the next slide, um, it's coming, but it's either a high or a low amount. 
So when, when we're applying that, we want to spray it till it's dripping. And, and we always want to um, <clears throat> prune or shape it before the application. Because if we would come in and prune it after we did it, we just took everything out. You know, and we're going to wait 8 to 12 weeks between treatments. That's the typical time period. So this is the rate chart that I was talking about. So the difference between the foliar applications is you're mixing either a low amount of one and a half ounces or three ounces to one gallon of water. So you're not doing the batch of one part product to 11 parts water on the foliar applications. So that's the difference there. Okay. Uh, soil applied rate chart. <clears throat> so, you know, this is telling you uh, the ready to use, the single application and, and, and can be applied anytime during the growing season or when the ground is not frozen. Go ahead, Kel. Where can you find all of these? Uh, they are on our website. Perfect or you can always email me and I can get them to you or that. So this is an interesting product. Uh, I'm almost to the fertilization and I know time's flying by, so I, I will pick up. But Minjet FE is our newest product. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next photo because I think that's the interesting. So Emmett, our Texas RTM treated this parking lot tree. They were gonna remove it in 2015 and he treated it with the Minjet FE. And you can see 2016, and 2017. So the next photo, he went back in and treated again in 2018, but this time he used shortstop and the Minjet FE and look at it in 2019. He totally turned that tree around. It, it was an amazing process. And, and so we're thinking we're gonna get two or three seasons out of that. You're good, Kale. you're good. All right, so fertilization. ArborJet designed a uh, with our partner Ecologel this ArborRx prescription fertilization and soil enhancement. So what we're doing is we're designing this to maximize tree and shrub health, uh, and we're combining the nutrition with soil quality. We're trying to stimulate root growth and improve that water availability. We talked about hydrotain, and the nice thing with this is this liquid solutions do not require any of the mechanical agitation. Some of the other stuff does. Most of all these products are tank compatible uh, for combination applications, and we have very flexible rates for easy job estimation. All right, so let's get into it. So we have primary and secondary treatment things, but Arborplex is a 14.45. It's a 50% slow release nitrogen. This is something that you're going to use in the spring, you know, uh, to do. But then we, we have different products, and we're going to talk about these individually. But we have, uh, you know, BioMP, we have Enviroplex, Iron Plus, NutriRoots, very unique. We've talked a little bit about Hydrotain, and we're going to talk about Cytogrill. But you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So Arborplex, this is a urea tri triazone, high-quality phosphorus, potassium with micronutrients. The benefits of this is it's a consistent extended feeding. We're going to see some photos coming up real quick about uh, what it looks like, but it improves the stress tolerance. And some of the, the data or research that we did, it made this aspen look like it was on steroids, uh, how big the leaves were. Uh, so this is perfect for your urban trees, you know, nutrient deficiencies if we're seeing a loss of vigor, you know, and depleted soil. So let's go ahead and go to the next, I believe. So look at this versus Arborplex versus uh, some of the other uh, fertilizers on the market. Look at the difference, you know, uh, quite a bit larger in that size. The average caliper that we treated was uh, 5.32 millimeters larger than the competitors. That's how much it put on the size of the caliper of the tree. That's really impressive, okay? So BioMP, this is unique, guys. This is your high carbohydrate molasses based soil conditioner. All right, this is designed to make uh, simulate biological activity. So you're gonna give a food source for all the microbes. This is gonna restore your soil to a healthy biology. We're gonna get better vigor. This is gonna break down the organic matter. You know, this is where we have low cation exchange, uh, low water holding. This is where we're gonna use that, okay? 
go ahead to the next enviroplex so this is uh, a concentrated soil conditioner with organic acids from leonard and Wright. so this is going to help with your water nutrient holding nutrient availability we're going to try to improve the soil structure and you can see uh, soil compaction water filtration so BioMP and Enviroplex is probably something I would do when I'm doing my uh, air spade or air knife work around the trees as a backfill chemical, you know, to help enhance that soil. Go ahead and go to the next. Um, Iron Plus, it's a 1500. Uh, th this is something that you would add to like your Minjet iron, you know, as an iron source because we know we have to correct the soil. So this is how we're doing it with this iron. So it's going to help uh, with... Uh, Chlorophyll production. It also has the seaweed extract, C extra. Uh, we're going to talk about Cytogrow for that. So, this is uh, going to help with that. Okay. Nutrient. So, this, this is a combination of hydrotain, Cytogrow, and one. So, this is what I would be using now, or anytime I plant a new tree or shrub, I would be recommending Nutrient. All right. It's going to give you three times the amount of root growth. It's going to improve your plant establishment, all your development. You can mix this with your water tank to add to your gator bags. Uh, this is going to last about a month on the water management, where hydrotain may last three months. So those are the different advantages, but you do get MPK223 with Nutrient. Go ahead and go to the next. Um, so th this is a before and after picture. So this is what I was talking about when a tree has a root ball that has, it's dry and like water's not penetrating it. Uh, he applied this and then look how the tree took off. Uh, and if you wanna go to the next one, look at this before and after, this is down at the Delaware beaches. Uh, he did one application one and a half months later with Nutriroot, look how the tree came back. It, it was amazing, you know? So th this is something that can help with winter desiccation, you know, and, and help maintaining the soil moisture. You know, Nutri-Root's a nice product. Uh, hydrotain, go ahead. We talked about Hydrotain, you know, three months, we can go to the next. Cytogrow, so this is an EPA registered uh, hormone biostimulant. It's one of the few out there. It, it's got your cytokines and auxins. So this is gonna help with rooting, uh, speeding establish and recovery, you know, incre increasing your transplant survival, stress tolerance. You could use this on sod. You could help use this with seeding. There, there's so many uh, applications for this. It, overall, it, it just helps uh, the landscape. Go ahead and go to the next. Uh, Bloomplex. So this would be for your flowers. You know, if you want to enhance flowering, flowering shrubs, annuals, ornamentals, vegetables, this is going to give you uh, vigor. And it has uh, the calcium, iron, manganese, and zinc. You know, it's a, and it's a great foliar option if you want to spray this on. Go ahead. Uh, NAX, this is our soil salt flush. This is something that you can use to break down uh, sodium salts. You know, it's going to reduce the sodium levels there, uh, help with the soil tilth and structure and uh, get, flush that uh, salt out of the area or, or calcium supply. So it's very cost effective too. You could use it on reclaimed water or poor, poor quality irrigation and stuff like that. Um, so ArborJet is a resource, you know, uh, our website is great. We have a YouTube page with multiple uh, videos if you want to learn about injections, uh, the equipment. Um, we also have a, an app, which I think is coming up on the next slide. Um, so we, we have educational websites. We, we have, we're going to talk about our staff. We have tech support. We have winter webinar seminar, uh, seminars. Uh, we, we we did a ton of uh, webinars and stuff like that. So, uh, and we're always working on different things. Go ahead. Arbor Mobile. So we just updated this. So this is one of those tools you can download and uh, find common uh, problems and solutions based on tree. You can look up different pests and diseases. Uh, there's label information. Uh, tree tag is, is something if you want to take notes and work on. You can find our marketing materials, links to YouTubes. Uh, you can use the project calculator, which will help you uh, determine cost on some things. So good, good tool to have. Go ahead. Uh, 
I think there's a couple bumps in this one too. I didn't forgot about the animation, sorry. So this is our tech staff. Uh, we do have a uh, professional agronomist. We have a multi-tool uh, research team, etymology, pathology, soil science. We have a formulator. Uh, you can see in the background our team. Uh, we've added commercial reps, uh, Rebecca and Eric Stephenson, and uh, Rob uh, Bauman is our, now our Midwest at, and Kevin Lewis is acting uh, as, as our commercial turf guy throughout the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. Okay, you can go to the next, I think. That's it. That's it. So questions. I did it a little bit before. Sorry. <laughs> it was a long night. I didn't think it was that much stuff, but yeah. I remember. 158 slides. You, uh, ah, you it went was for it. Educational. Educational. Yeah, very educational. Thank you. Um, covered a lot of things there. I didn't get to use our, our little... Hold on. You want to put the hat on? Yeah, I'm trying to get the, <laughs> the hat. There he is. Didn't get to use this at all. Uh, all right. Questions. So, um, <clears throat> first one here, uh, I'm just going to read this. Uh, Susan Poisner is asking, uh, when you talk about soil testing, how important is it uh, and how important is correcting the nutrient levels in the soil? I, I mean, certain plants will only live with certain nutrients. Uh, I'm not telling you it's a requirement, but it, it does add value to your business when you can do those soil tests because there may be an underlying factor that you don't know, like there might be something that's way high that needs to be corrected and that's why the, the plant or tree is not living, if that makes sense. Um, okay, and then on the second part of that is uh, what outline tools do you use to help implement soil testing results and so you know how much NPK to get uh, into the soil? Uh, it would be based on what your result, results came back. You know, you could determine that based on that soil test, how much you would need. Uh, you could look and I guess determine, you know what I mean? Without seeing mm -hmm. the results, that maybe that's something we do next time. I'll have one of those and we can discuss it. Okay. That might be good. That gives us somewhere to go for uh, the next one. Uh, yep. Sean Smith asking how the AccuFlow works compared to the, in, to, compared to the inject system. Uh, the difference is, is you have a battery operated pressure tool pushing it in. I, I believe it's lighter. You're not carrying the weight in, in the whole device on your hands. Uh, you're carrying the weight in the backpack and the, the device is 11 feet. Uh, most guys that I've talked to so far have said they, they prefer the uh, active flow over that just because it's lighter and they're not pushing it into the ground to pump it. They're just turning the handle on to do the injection. It's a little bit easier. Gotcha. Um, looking through here. Um, do you perform field soil tests at all, or are you sending all of your soil tests out to the lab? Uh, you, you can look at it. I mean, you can make some determinations by that. And there are kits that I know you can uh, purchase uh, to do some of that stuff in the field. So, I mean, it, it, it's what your preference is. You know, it, you don't always have to do it. I mean, you might pull it up and say, oh, well, it, it's sandy soil. I just need to do this because I see it's sandy. You know, you can make simple determinations. Uh, but if there's a pre if there's a something that you don't understand, then I, I might go to the soil test because knowing what's going on there can tell you so many things. Gotcha. Um, and then were there, were there any changes made to shortstop after Arborjet picked it up? Uh, the shrub label. That that was the newest thing last added year. Added in shrubs. We added the shrubs so you can do full air application. So now it's a one-stop shop to do everything. Okay. Awesome. Well, I'm going to a couple seconds here uh, while I, I uh, type out the link to the quiz for the CEUs. Uh, once again, uh, with the CEUs, the way that it works for us is you have to pass the test. And I think it's 16 out of 20 questions. you got to get them right. Um, and, uh, if you do it now, like live, it's, it's, it's June 10th, uh, then you can earn two free CEUs. If you do it later on, if you're listening to this recorded in the future, then it's only going to be worth one CEU. So, um, there's that. I'm going to write that out, post it here in the comments, both on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, and if nobody else has any other questions, then, uh, I think we're good to go. 
thanks. Thanks for having me. Guys, oh, great night. Uh, other thing I wanted to say is that uh, you can reach Trent at his uh, email here. If you have, um, <laughs> yeah, if you have any questions about PHC and you can't remember this or you didn't write it down, uh, you can uh, always email PHC at Tree Stuff. Uh, we have that as a way that we can get you in touch uh, with people uh, from ArborJet uh, who can help you out. So thank you, Trent. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, and uh, have a nice night. Yep, thank you. Thank you.